This is the Free Heal Life Podcast, episode number 81. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Heal Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And Free Heal Lifers, protectors of the turn, we're back. And it's another lovely week here in Salt Lake City. And hopefully you had a fantastic weekend chilling out. But I've got a great episode and not a whole lot of newsroom and notes. As I mentioned last week, I've started cutting the cores for the Protector series of skis. Really, really fun to get my hands dirty on this project and get it going. Uh, So thanks to everyone that has gotten in on this first run. As I mentioned, we're going slow and steady. And if you're on the waiting list or interested, we appreciate your patience in advance as we're just trying to do it right from the get-go. So I'll be posting some stuff on... uh, here and there on the on the Instagram account and stuff like that in the forums. And uh, yeah, just kind of keep you up to date with what we're doing with it. And uh, if we're going to have a bunch of skis available in the shop or not, we're just kind of, especially uh, things are kind of crazy, right? You know, I'm sure if you guys are out there and you know materials, costs are always rising right now. And so we're just, uh, we're, we're playing it, playing it safe <laughs> little by little. But yeah, we're uh, we're starting on that. So, other than that, you can still connect with us on all the social media channels. Uh, head on over to telemarkskier.com and become a subscriber. If you don't want to become a subscriber, but you want to help us build that community, we have our new forum on telemarkskier.com. We would love for you to get in on that, and we've got a nice active community budding over there. People talking and sharing ideas, talking gear, talking telly all that good stuff. So we would love to have you be a part of that. So today, my guest is another one of my favorite Midwestern telemark skiers that I've met over the years. He grew up primarily in Minnesota, where he learned how to ski on the local hills near his house and participated on the local ski team. He also spent many of his winters taking family vacations to Summit County, Colorado, where he was able to experience the Rockies. It was during that time that he saw his first telemark skiers at Monarch Mountain. Then, in 1974, he moved to Michigan. He was working at a local ski shop as a tech and skiing Timber Ridge and was likely the first telemark skier in this area during that time. He was even told several times at different resorts that this type of skiing was not allowed at their hill for safety reasons and he would have to demonstrate his competency prior to being able to ride the lifts. In the late 1980s, he started homebrewing beer. He did that for a few years, and during that time was introduced to Life Tools, a shop in Green Bay, Wisconsin, that had started a Telemark Festival for the Midwest. They asked him to provide beer for the festival, which continued to be a staple for many years after. He became a professional brewer in 1996 and even owned his own brewery, The Livery, in Benton Harbor, Michigan in the mid-2000s. He currently lives in Kalamazoo, Michigan. He loves playing pedal steel guitar along with telemark skiing and every other act- outdoor activity you can think of. So please welcome to the show my good friend, Steve Berthel. All right, Steve, welcome to the podcast. How are you, brother? I'm doing good, Josh. How about you? Good. It's weird calling you Steve. Awesome. It's weird calling you Steve. <laughs> I know it. Well, just don't call me late for dinner. I know. So. I'll I'll just call you Bert from here on out. I think that's uh, all right. I yeah. think I think everybody knows you as Bert, not uh. Almost everybody does. I think yeah. almost. I know it was funny. I I thought about that before I called you. I was like, wait a sec, I gotta like, I should introduce him by his actual <laughs> his actual name. Yeah. Oh, well, so now fun. we're letting all the secrets out, you know. So now it's not gonna be a secret anymore that my name's not Bert. It's Steve. Everybody's so. like, who? Steve who? Like, yeah, (laughs) that's awesome, man. So, um, and where, uh, you're living, where, where are you living right now? Kalamazoo? Is that right? Kalamazoo, Michigan, home of checker cabs, Pfizer vaccine, and used to be Gibson guitars too. So I love it. That's awesome, man. Gibbs, and you are a musician that we've bonded on that aside from, uh, aside from, aside from telly, uh, you are one of, one of my, well, I want to say few friends, but uh, one of the few people that actually plays pedal steel guitar, so which is uh, yeah. difficult. Yeah, you don't find you know 
10 people in one room that play pedal steel very often so no i i think i i think i hooked did you didn't we ever hook you up with our buddy ryan who plays pedal steel yeah i uh he was playing with your brother's band lauren's band and uh, i talked to him on the phone and emailed some stuff you know and uh he sent me some of his uh recordings that he'd done and besides the band stuff and yeah nice guy and you know it's always uh nice to talk to people that are professional road musicians instead of somebody just hangs out in the basement playing you know so yeah anyways and he's a lot of these people have mentored me you know and stuff so yeah and he's uh who's the he's really into marshall tucker band uh who's the pedal steel guy that played for him tory caldwell yeah that's unbelievable he's yeah he's went clear on us he doesn't he's not on the planet anymore but yeah i I saw that tour when they came out that album with fire on the mountain He, he played big entourage brings out his pedal steel and his amp and he plays one song and they haul it off and he's back to guitar playing <laughs> yeah. i was like no bring us more yeah <laughs> well and for people that don't know pedal steel it's like it's not just lap steel you know it's it's no. it's a uh, no. it's like f- basically it's got two is it oct is are there two sets of strings that are two octaves well oct- they make two different kinds well actually three different kinds so you've got a single 10 just a narrow one neck, 10 strings. And that's usually an E ninth tuning, which is, you know, E ninth with some chromatics, E tuning, and then pedals and knee levers, which change raise or lower strings. And then you got an SD 10 or an SD 11 or an SD 12, which is the same strings on a wider body. And then you get a double neck and then that would have two different tunings on it. Like the old console steels. Mm-hmm. So, you know, not to get into something confusing that has nothing to do with skiing, but <laughs> the whole reason they invented this instrument was to be able to play the Western one, four five chord progression within two or three frets. And you get your minors and your seventh chords and all that good stuff just by depressing pedals and, you know, using your knees to move knee levers. So my steel has four pedals, five knee levers, a volume pedal. So we say it, it takes the left foot, the right foot, the left knee, the right knee, the left hand, the right hand, and the left brain and the right brain. So <laughs> pretty much there's not many parts left over that you could use to play steel. Yeah. You're using them all. So Yeah, so for for all you listeners out there that always think I should never say telemark is hard, uh, it's not as hard as pedal steel. Let's put it that way. <laughs> no, no, pedal steel is definitely the hardest thing I've ever undertaken in my life. And this August I celebrate my tenth anniversary of having the hook set in my jaw and falling down the rabbit hole with this crazy instrument. Oh, but, uh, I love it. That's I awesome. It. Well, congrats. Yep. 10 years. That's a good yep. solid chunk, man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so, so kind of going back to the beginning, I mean, you're, uh, did you, you did you grow up in Michigan? I've, I've always known you in Michigan, but I don't know if that's yeah, where you're from. No, I, I was born in Southern Illinois down by, uh, uh, Springfield, Illinois. And my parent, my dad worked for Upjohn Company, then, you know, pharmaceutical company based out of Kalamazoo. And uh, he was a salesman and we ended up moving to Kalamazoo when I was starting kindergarten. And then from there, he got promoted to a district manager position with Upjohn in Minneapolis. So we lived on the western suburbs out in Lake Minnetonka. And when I was six years old, my parents bought me my first pair of skis. And it's pretty hilly there. So when they, you know, they said, well, you know, you got to learn to go down the hill in the backyard and stop at the bottom. And then after that, you got to go to the neighbor's hill, which is twice as big. It had three trees in a row. So that was our little kid slalom course. (laughs) And when I could make turns both ways through the trees and stop at the bottom, my mom took me to Highland Hills, which is a little tiny ski area with rope toes, uh, just south of, well, it's like right by, uh, 494, which is the business route 94 and I 35, which goes north south through the U.S. And uh, my mom would pick me up at school at 2:30 and have all my ski stuff. I put my suit on and my boots, and she dropped me at the ski area. I think a lift pass for me was a buck and a quarter, and she picked me up at 5:30 and bring me home for dinner. And that's how I learned to ski. Was basically 
first thing I did is learn how to go straight down the hill and spray everybody in the lift line. So I was one of those kids, you know, so like the super speed plow to the bottom and then spray. everybody. Yeah, so there has a, there's not, not much has changed in, you know, uh, 56 or 58 years. So anyways, that's amazing. I, you know what I, I love is when I talk to people and, and, uh, the way they learned how to ski is their parents just dropping them off because like that seems yeah. so unheard of now you, you know? would never get that now i mean kids would sue their parents for child abuse and you know who knows what the trouble they could get into so i know yeah i mean it was like the old days were something different than now that's for sure yeah so. for sure well that's that's cool and 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 so i mean i guess i didn't even that was kind of my next question it was like when did you start skiing but sounds like you you started pretty early on being yeah, around snow yeah. well being in the midwest there was a lot of snow but um yeah but downhill skiing um and then so when when did you um so did i follow that right you moved to minnesota growing up yeah and then you know and then you know i pretty much grew up and graduated high school in 1973 there and i raced you know on for the ski team and actually got kicked off the wrestling team because I was skiing too, and they were afraid I was going to get hurt. And uh, I said, "Well, <laughs> screw you. Wrestling's fun, but skiing's way more fun." Oh, so, that's you funny. know. And uh, then I, my dad got transferred to Kalamazoo, so you know, I moved to uh, Michigan in uh, 1974. And uh, previous to that, my, you know, my dad knew all these doctors out in Colorado, so. Our family vacations, we never went to Disney World or anything. In the summer, we'd go up northern Minnesota, rent a cabin, and go fishing and canoeing in the Boundary Waters, you know, when I was just a little kid. And then we started taking family vacations for Christmas break and we, or spring break. And we'd go out to Summit County, and my dad could get a condo or a house from somebody. They wouldn't charge him and give him a gold pass, so we skied, you know, Breckenridge, Keystone, Arapaho, and Copper pretty much for free. And we just, you know, I had five siblings. So we'd load up the family truckster and buy groceries in Denver and proceed, you know, to ski for, you know, two weeks straight, basically. And that was our family vacation, summer and winter. And so, you know, at an early age, all of us kids were like, you know, skiing Monarch and stuff and like knee deep, waist deep powder going, how the hell do you do this? You know? So, I had actually, you know, when I was in high school, I saw some guys at Monarch Telemark skiing, and I'm going, what the hell is that? And that's when I started thinking about this stuff. And I think it was, it's got to be almost 40 years ago. So, uh, you know, that's when I first tried it myself on my 205 wood Norwegian Mad Shoes Berkey Beaners with uh, Rotafella blue bindings and Normark rubbery boots that were high top and uh it was crazy you know i had found that cross-country technique book that had a guy who was showing how to do a telemark turn at the back of it and we literally would hold that book in our hand looking at how to change our ski position so you'd slide left foot forward drop your knee and slide sideways for half the hill and then switch and you may just made two telly turns you know so this so. is so this is back in the what mid 70s yeah, late 70s. Or late, late yeah, 70s. Probably about 70. Uh, so it's got to be 39 years. I think two years ago at Telefest, I figured it had been 39 years I'd been tele skiing. Wow. And so, uh, you know, now it's like 41 years. So what would that be? It'd be like 1980, I think. Yeah. yeah. Nin- yep. Right around or, Yeah, 79, so, 80. Yeah. Yep. Wow. And so then a buddy of mine, uh, I worked at a sporting goods store, you know, as a ski tech in the winter and a carpenter in the summer and a guy that worked there, he started his own ski shop and he started carrying, uh, you know, some pretty high end cross country gear. Skating hadn't really entered the scene at that time. So I said, Hey, can you give me any telemark equipment? So my first real telemark equipment going from those wooden skis was, uh, uh, trucker, uh, race. What was it called? Uh, something edge race series with Chenard three pins and an Oslo extreme boot. Oh, that's a, that's and, a, that's a good setup. Yeah. And so that, you know, then those ended up getting stolen and then I got a pair of Phoenix skis 
and those kept bending. So then I think I went to a Kniesel White Star uh, in like a 205 with no side cut. And then uh, the Fishers, when they came out, the SCS or that white ski with kind of pink graphics, you know, uh, they were like a generation after the black ones. And, you know, there was just a bunch of skis in there. Merrill had skis that were like just skinny and long and no side cut and super stiff. And then the big revelator for me was when uh, Tua came out with the uh, Tele Sauvage and Magnum Sauvage. And then that's about when Merrill started making the red, you know, uh, plastic upper on their boot. Yeah. And all of a sudden you've got a stiffer boot that comes up high and it's like, holy cow. It's like when cars got power steering. <laughs> you know, wow, this is a lot better. So yeah. So you were working I wish I oh I wish I had stuff that I had in those days, you know, now, but I don't. So Yeah, no, it's it's hard to hold on to that stuff. Well so so was this in Kalamazoo that you were working at that shop as a tech? Yep. Yep. Nice. And then, so what was the, what was your local ski hill back then? Uh, Timber Ridge, all of about 200 feet high. Uh, you know, I actually got punched out by a lifty for telemarking down the beginner hill, trying to learn this thing. And I mean, it almost knocked me out and then we got in a big tussle. And then another ski area up in Grand Rapids called Cannonsburg, I, they wouldn't even let me cross the bridge after I bought a lift pass because I had telemark skis. I told them, I says, you know, get the owner of the ski area, head of ski school, your ski patrollers, let's go make a run anywhere you want. If you don't think I can handle it, I'll leave. And they kicked me out and wouldn't give me a refund. So really? in the old days, it was like what they did to snowboarders, you know, they did the telemark skiers then. So, yeah, I've at heard, least in Michigan, you know, I've heard stories of that. That's crazy. I don't. I, I I've heard stories about how that was in the early days, and it, yeah, it's it seems weird now because obviously no one would say anything if you showed up on tele skis. Oh, yeah, but, uh, no, you end up with a crowd of people asking you questions, you know, for sure. But yeah, this was a long time ago, and you know, people just didn't know what to think about it. They, that's not real skiing. So of course they made you put a, a leash on those skis even though the bindings didn't release. And, you know, we did pull a few screws out of the binding tops on some different skis, you know, uh, construction and, you know, and ski shapes and stuff really didn't change much till the nineties. So, yeah, you know, it was all hippie sticks and you did the best you could. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and were there other, were there other telemarkers that you were getting to know in, in like Timber Ridge, Kalamazoo, or were you finding there was in- one or two? Yeah. That's about it. And, you know, the people that used to tell me back then that still live in town still tell me and come up to Tully Fest in the Porcupines every year. So we go back a long way. You know, uh, I was probably oh, the first one in Kalamazoo to start doing this on a regular basis, you know, and everybody laughed at me. And But then I started racing and, you know, adult race league and with my handicap, I was just creaming everybody. <laughs> and then they got all started taking notice. So actually at one point uh, in the 90s, we had a Bell's Brewery here in Kalamazoo sponsored our team and we were called the Pinheads, Bell's Pinheads. No way. And we, we For like three years in a row, we were the number one ski team with you know men and women skiing telly and running gates and we just had a blast it's because you guys you were know? you guys were well fueled so to speak yes we were <laughs> yes we were well that 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 kind of um that kind of uh, helps me kind of lead in because i i know the first time i ever heard of you was because of beer and yes what was funny is i had just gotten the job as editor at telemark skier magazine probably 2009 and someone had put well actually no did it no 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 yeah i I don't somebody i know from kalamazoo met you in utah yeah and well and i remember they were like this there's this guy in michigan who's making Tellywhacker beer. And I was like, <laughs> Tellywhacker beer? I'm like, what is that? <laughs> and um, I, I, I was like, I got to write an article about this guy. And so I tracked you down and yep. and we did an article in the print magazine about Tellywhacker. So where, so obviously you were, you're in the 90s, you're, you're racing for Bells, but when did your your journey as a brewer start? Like, how did that all come about? Uh, you know, I, in the late 80s and into the mid-90s, I 
race mountain bikes in the, the Michigan circuit. And I was at that point, I was riding for Trek bike company out of Wisconsin. And I was running expert vet class. And, you know, we raced every Sunday and we were at this points race and it got delayed. And uh, so I'm talking to this guy who's a junior expert. So we in, in the same class, but he was like 20 years younger than me. And, you know, I saw him all the time. I had never met. I said, hey, let's hook up afterwards. We'll have a beer. So, of course, we were drinking Bell's beer. And, you know, so we were in the parking lot. And, you know, we get talking. He was a grad student at Western for chemistry. And I asked him what he did for fun besides biking. He goes, oh, I'm a home brewer. I go, oh, man, that's so cool. I really want to do that. Because I remember, you know, we were all drinking, you know, Budweiser and stuff. And then Larry Bell started Bell's beer. You could buy a one-gallon cube of this uncarbonated dark beer that was like 6% alcohol. To us, that was like moonshine, and it tasted pretty good. So, you know, we go down there, and we fill these gallon cubes up and ride our bikes back home and get totally sloshed on that stuff. <laughs> Anyways, started making beer with this guy, and, uh, you know, he ended up going to Albuquerque to another grad school. And so I got the apartment downtown and uh, all the homebrew stuff. So I brewed on my own for another year, and this was like probably 88 or something. And then I started doing all grain brewing, which means you don't buy kits anymore, and you're used, you know, you're crushing the barley and adding the hops, and you're adding your yeast and blah, blah, blah. So anyways, I really got into it, and Larry Bell and all his staff were my mentors to get me on the righteous path of making a good beer. And so my friend Alan Fici was a car rep. And he dealt with this place over in Green Bay, Wisconsin, called Life Tools. And Life Tools was a sporting goods store that featured telemark equipment, climbing gear, and homebrew supplies, hence the name. <laughs> so, you know, they covered all the bases. So Alan had picked up a couple of cases of my beer and was sharing them with the employees and the owners of the ski shop. And next thing I know, the phone rings and... Uh, it's the owner of the ski shop. He goes, Hey, you know, I, I own, I'm the owner of this store in green Bay and we sponsor this telemark ski festival up in the porcupine mountains. We're coming into the third year. Would you be interested in making beer for us? I'm like, sure. You know, what do you want? I don't know anything. You know, I'm like, I'll take care of it. So that's when I came up with a recipe for this hoppy brown ale. This was called telly whacker. And one of the original, uh, guys that was involved with this was from marquette his name was gary ruther really strong backcountry telly skier and you know just a real mountain man won the uphill downhill race every year and he was a really good artist so he made this really cool label of this guy in red ski pants and a blue parka tellying through the birch trees with big snowflakes coming down which is the, still the image we use for that beer and uh so uh, you know for the third Tele Fest that we had in Michigan, and now it's celebrated what thirty-two years. Yeah, this yeah. last year, <laughs> uh, you know. So I've been involved with them for like twenty-nine years. You know, making beer for this thing, and then I finally got a job as a professional brewer at a local brewery in nineteen ninety-six. So then we made Tele Wacker and bottled it there. They bring up Tele Fest, and then I left there in two thousand four and started a brewery on the west side of Michigan and it called the livery and we made telly whacker there and, and bottled that and brought it up. And, you know, so every brewery I've been part of through my 23 years as a professional brewer, I always had telly whacker ale available and we package it if we had the ability to do it and always brought it up to telly fest. And, uh, it's become like a mainstay up there and it's, it's always been fun, you know, to, uh, have a beer already in place you know, with a Michigan resident, a Michigan brewer, and a Michigan telly skier doing it. So, you know, every year it's like, what else did you bring? So I was informed very early on, do not bring any more of your Doppelbach because we found people passed out in the snow banks <laughs> on the way back to the where the camping area was for telly fest, you know. And uh, so I, you know, I said, all right, I'll keep it under like 8%. You yeah, know, that, keep everybody safe. But. That's saying that's saying a lot for a Midwesterner not being able to handle it. <laughs> I know it. you guys are built with different livers out there. I'm pretty sure. So yeah, well, you know, it's our uh, Scandahuvian upbringing. Exa you know? so. <laughs> exactly. That's funny. Well, and and so yeah, that's what was so cool is that 
Um, well, first, I didn't realize you had the Life Tools connection. That's a whole story. I want to get those guys yeah, that, on the podcast. Yeah, that is a whole nother podcast right there. Yeah, I, I, and I met those guys at the 30th annual Telefest, yep. and that's yep. when I got up there and I saw you. And man, and I had no idea because, you know, you, you think, like how did this all you know how did tele skiing thrive at certain points and where did it come from and the midwest until until you guys told me about life tools i i didn't really know what the origin was and yeah that's a really cool story so we'll, yeah we'll have to get those guys on but um but yeah the tele whacker that's how i i found you and then when i started making ski movie well kind of in that same era i was going to tour this the telemark movies i was making uh, along with the magazine when I was there. And, and I, wasn't the first one Hippies, Punks, and Misfits? The fir- Well, so, funny enough, the first one was called The Free Heel Life, and the second was okay, called... Okay, that's right. Yeah, Free Heel Life 2, Hippies, Punks, and Misfits, but... That's, yeah, then, yeah, yeah. Then it, and so like it's so funny because to this day i'm like oh yeah when i used to make telly movies i went through michigan and they're like oh what cities you know and and i'd be like benton harbor and i just wait for the reaction oh yeah telemark <laughs> be, you know hotbed of you know michigan <laughs> right <laughs> people are always like what benton harbor why did you go to benton harbor i'm like well here's there's this guy bert and he had the livery it was this killer brewery with this awesome like stage and and yeah yeah, yeah. So then I came there for a few years and, and, uh, you went with me that one year we went up to, yeah, uh, Alan went with us and we went all through Traverse city and Petoskey and stuff. Yep. We did up in the bigger, the 500 foot Hills, you know? Yes. Yeah, so. Cause there's that crew up in nubs knob and we met yeah, up yeah, at, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, Josh outfitter. at the outfitter there. Yep, yep. Outfitter Harbor Springs. And then I think, so yeah, we had a couple kegs of Tellywhacker on that tour as well. Yeah, and t-shirts and stuff. Totally, and I think didn't weren't you with me when we went to um, Mount Ho- uh, Mount well, Holiday? Yeah, yes, yes, and it was raining. <laughs> yeah, totally. Okay, because and and for for those of you that aren't familiar, like Traverse City is near Crystal Mountain, Michigan, which is a, a ski yeah. resort there. But in this, there's a there's a little ski area literally like inside of a neighborhood called Mount, oh, Hol- yeah. Mount holiday. And it's like a nonprofit kind of local ski hill. Um, but yeah, there's a, there was a good little scene there and yeah, you, we, we had Telly Wacker there and then we went down to the, to the, uh, livery and went there yep. for, for a couple of years. But yeah, you were, you yeah. were always a great host, man. So that, that was always a great time. Yeah, it was big fun. And then, you know, that was a lot long time ago. And like you said, like 2009, 2010, probably. And it was two years ago at Telefest that you and I finally got to make turns together with JT. Oh, yeah. And and also John and Greg that own Life Tools. I actually skied with those guys for the first time, too. Oh, so man. after all these years, you know, it all came together full circle that's so for cool. the 30th anniversary. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's so cool. I know. Isn't that funny? It's like, I can't tell you how many people I've met friends through telemark skiing that I haven't actually telemark skied with. Yeah, I know. It's tough. Yeah. You know, there's just not enough days in the week, you know? Yeah. So no, that's, that's funny. Well, so yeah, so that kind of brings in the brewery stuff and then you start making um beer for the festivals and i mean did you did you keep brewing well i guess i guess you said you've been in the beer world for like 20 some years so you, yes in 1996 i mean what, what I, i'm i'm actually curious about this because home brewing obviously now is like you know there's micro breweries and all this but in the eight, oh, yeah. in the 80s like what was it like? I mean, it must've been really small, like people brewing in their houses and then like a microbrewery. I mean, that was like, did you ever think it would, well, be- beer would get this big? Uh, no, you know, we talk about that all the time. Uh, so when I started brewing in 96, there was, I think maybe 20 breweries total in the state of Michigan. And now there's over 400. Wow. And uh, there was just a core group of people and not all of them are alive anymore or not all of them are in the industry anymore. But, you know, I still keep in really close contact with almost everybody that we all helped each other in those days because there were no egos. <laughs> the Michigan Brewers Guild was just a fledgling organization started in 2001. 
And I joined for the first time in 2005 and did my first beer festival. And then when I started delivery, I got uh, talked into being part of the Michigan Brewers Guild Board of Directors, which I kept that position for eight years. And with that, booked all the music for our sold out festivals, which by the time my tenure ended, we had four sold out festivals, one in Marquette that was two days, one in Ypsilanti that was two days, one in Grand Rapids in the winter that was two days, and then a two-day festival in Eastern Market in Detroit, which is the largest farm market in Michigan. So, you know, we had all these little areas that we would do festivals to make it convenient for beer lovers to go to a local festival. And I would only book bands from, like if it was up in Marquette, I'd only book you know, UP bands. And, you know, I didn't really import anybody into an area that they didn't live in. So people would, you know, support their local breweries in the area within 50 miles. They would support venues, a lot of breweries that did live music. So that was a pretty cool scene in those days. And, you know, back in the old days, we didn't have any volunteers. So we were there for two days setting up and there two days afterwards tearing down. And it was a lot of work for free. You know, we we're all volunteers, but we loved it. It was a passion. It was all new. Now, you know, everything's so different in the industry. And that's one of the reasons I'm not part of it anymore. I just kind of burned out on it. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot of money in that anymore unless you sell your soul to the bankers. And uh, I wasn't about to do that. So, you know, it was a fun run. And, you know, now I just brew with my buddy. We have a about a 35-gallon brew house. And uh, we got a canning line. So, still making beer and labeling it and giving it away to our friends. So it's a lot of fun. Oh my God. That's so great. So you have your own like canning system so you can can. Oh your yeah. Beer? Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yep. And I think we made more beer. Probably shouldn't say this, but we <laughs> made more beer than a lot of the little nano breweries in our area, like way more beer. Oh. I think we were brewing like hundred. I think our biggest year we brewed 150 barrels. Oh my God. And a barrel's 31 gallons, you know, but we never sold it, you know, and we had right on the can sample only. So I was working when I started doing this after I quit working professionally, I worked with a woman up in Empire, Michigan by Sleeping Bear Dunes, which is up by Travers. Uh, and she's a farmer and she grows brewers barley and has her own malt house. So she's one of only like four female maltsters in the whole nation. And, uh, I met her years before and she told me that's what she wanted to do. And so I worked with her as an R and D in sales. And then I worked with a guy that uh, was a broker for Michigan hops. And then I had worked with a woman out of Houghton Hancock up in the Keweenaw peninsula up by Mount Bohemia that, uh, trapped indigenous lager and ale strains wild in the UP and then cloned typical strains that you would use in a brewery. So, you know, we had the whole Michigan thing going on in my last brewery I worked for for five years. I, all my beer at the pub was made with all Michigan ingredients. And I worked with Michigan State University and, you know, knew all the farmers and everybody. And, you know, we just spoke publicly and, you know, on TV and, you know, conferences and what have you about using Michigan ingredients and how to source them and what's different and what's not. So it's really a fun way to kind of ease out of the industry and so now you know i still use all michigan ingredients in my beer and still do r&d work for this woman up in empire and director in the new malt she wants to do and we make beer and we hand it out to brewers they want to see what michigan tastes like in a can and uh it's been moderately successful it's still a tough road to hoe but uh i don't do the sales end anymore i'm getting old and lazy i want to play more than i want to work so <laughs> i'm trying to make that happen so. Yeah, that's that's pretty incredible though. Like that's cool, just that down home sourcing stuff from your area. You know, whether it's music or supporting your brewery or like ingredients to make stuff. I love that stuff. That's so cool. Well, you know, that's it's going to bring our, our economies and our communities back together. You know, yeah, supporting local and forget the box store, shop the mom and pops, and know your farmers at the farm market and feed your family what they have a hand in growing and washing and picking and everything else, you know, I mean, that's truly knowledge that should stay with people their, their whole life. And uh, it's a good way to keep your community thriving too. So, you know, it's been my mission to bring that message to people 
on stage and in conferences and everything else for the last 25 years plus. And a lot of people come back to me. I don't even know who they are. They said, oh, I heard you speak. And I just want you to know, we go to the farm market every Saturday with our kids and they love it. And they're hooked on it. You know, thank you. I'm going, wow, that's awesome. So, you know. Yeah, that makes it's a lot. just a cool thing. To, it's a good thing to be part of. So no, I love that. And and you know, like whether you're talking about telemark or you're talking about beer, you know, or anything else, it's like there's certain things that get passed on from generation to generation. And I I I think I I think what what you're saying rings really true, especially today. Is like people are, I think people are realizing the importance of. Um, like learn like you said like the bells guy like how he mentored you in the beginning you know and like Mm -hmm. you know there's there's people that pass things on and and i don't know you know sometimes that corporatization of stuff kind of eats away at that and and you know there's no i'm sure like making i've never made beer but i'm sure there's you know, there's no shortcuts to making great beer is just like telemark turns. Patience. Is, yeah. Patience and time and, and, uh, execution and practice and failure. And yep. All and, those things. you know, that's, that's anything in life, Josh, you know, uh, I mean, look at the telly turn back in the seventies and eighties. Nobody did it. When you're out skiing, you'd see one other person with a heel lifting up in the lift line. And it was like a race all day to catch that person. So how long have you been skiing, man? What are you skiing on? Check this out. You know, oh, I'm having trouble with my left turn there. Okay, look, try this little technique. So it was like a brother and sisterhood of people. In the early days of brewing, it was the same way. And, you know, it's like if it was easy, it would be called snowboarding, right? Yep. So, you know, I love that bumper sticker from K2. It's just funny. And the other one, ran down a French for can't tell me. So, the classic, you know. Yes, but you know, it was a hard turn to master. It was a hard turn just to do. And the ski moguls, like go out to tire ride and ski, can't make them and make them, you know. And you you would be schooled and how much work this turn really is until you get your fitness base built, and that does not come overnight. And you know, we were always laughing at all. We could always tell the alpine skiers because they're not doing the full knee drop, you know, making fun of them while you're cheating. Mm. You know, and back in the old days, if you didn't have heel to toe, uh, you get points taken off your time, you know, or added to it. I can't remember how they did it, but, you know, uh, it was like, it was hard work. It was really tough, you know, to learn it. But once we did, when you could ski anything you wanted, powder, moguls, you know, corduroy, you know, it was the whip. And it's like, wow, this is really cool. And being a brewer in the early days, it was kind of the same thing. We're walking uncharted territory. You know, th- that was the most creative aspect of the brewing industry worldwide. It was like, I would say the mid to late 90s and early 2000s was when things really went through the charts, both with ski equipment and with brewing. And, you know, I, I see a definite parallel with a lot of that stuff. And, uh, you know, you stick with it and you learn your chops and you do it the right way. And, you know, you, you, you know, it's pays off for the rest of your life. So, yeah, no, I love that. Well, and it sounds, sounds like you, like you said, you're kind of in search of just having fun these days and kind of, you know, getting out and adventuring. And I know we just talked, you just got back from Colorado and, and yeah, you were, was out there in Ure for a, a month and yeah, so I like, wish I would have brought skis, man. There were some beauty tracks down uh, Red One and Two on Red Mountain Pass, uh, and I imagine Commodore was looking pretty good too up there. But uh, I was just like, didn't have any room. I was all full of tools, you know, for helping my buddy. But yeah, it, we got like 18 inches of snow when I was out there, and it everybody was skiing up around Telluride. You know, everybody's going to work after lunch and skiing a couple runs in the morning. The yeah country there so for once it was safe you know so yeah totally it kind of settled out i mean those are some big mountains up there for those that haven't oh, been, yes. in that, been in that area if you ever get to the, get a <laughs> chance to drive red mountain pass like like uh bert's talking about i mean it's like probably one of the most epic drives i mean there's parts on that where there's no guardrail and it's like two lane and it's like a massive and it's like drop. 2, <laughs> feet straight down no. I'll be honest, when I drove it this time, I i mean, I felt my sphincter pucker up a little <laughs> bit, you know? You never know. Because, you know, we had all this snow, and then it was melting, and there was rock falls everywhere down there. And, you know, they got nets, but, I mean, 
all you need is a right size bowl to knock you right off the road for you know? sure yeah no when it gets so, when it gets wet up there i've i've been on that when it yeah like you said you get rock fall and you just water and ice on the road i mean it's it's oh uh, yeah yeah, there's a pucker factor for sure, and 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 you're yep. in a car. It's like it's yeah. like high. It's like it's like being high in the mountains, but in a car kind of feel. I don't know how to explain it, but that's definitely one of those yeah. drives where, if you get get a chance to do it, you know, going up into Silverton and and Ure and yeah. all that. It's, yeah, it's, it's just so beautiful. Yeah, that's an amazing spot. And Telly rides a that's a badass mountain, man. There's always been a good, yeah, good Telly scene in that zone too. Oh yeah, there's some really good skiers out of that area. Yeah, but you, you got some biking in or something while you were there since you got yeah we skiing. we rode Holy Cross and Grand Junction on the lunch loops and uh, <laughs> this is definitely the most techy trail I've ever ridden. You know, we got nothing that re- resembles that in Michigan. And uh, two miles in, I came off a blind rollover and it was a like a thirty foot steep, you know degree or 30 foot tall 30 35 degree angle rock slab with sand on it and i kind of tapped my rear brake and i slid out and i went down and tangled up in a down tree at the bottom and oh. went to shift for a climb and there was no shifter there oh, uh, so no. i ended up pushing all the hills for six miles on the rest of the loop and then rode the downhills oh, you know so you just snapped, you like, snapped your shifter off or yeah something? just you know, I was all gouged up and stuff, bleeding. It's like, all right, great way to start the vacation. <laughs> but a, a guy at a local bike shop right by the pub we went to for lunch and some beers afterwards gave me a shifter and sold me a cable. And so, you know, we got my bike fixed and we rode the rat trails in Ridgeway on May 1st when they opened up right after uh, elk calving season was done. And I had a good ride there and I did a little bit of riding in Sedona, not much. It's so crowded down there that I couldn't even stomach it you know so yeah but yeah yeah we were hoping to do a week-long adventure with some skiing and rafting and biking but that's going on hold for a bit yeah i just had to get back so uh anyways no that's awesome man well i'm glad you got some good spring spring post skiing adventures in. that's awesome yeah yeah a little bit so a little bit well cool man well um next year um yeah, I I actually uh, last week had a, another guy from Detroit on um, on the podcast, and uh, Michigan's hot, man. It's crazy. Like I was even asking, I'm like, "Do you know Bert?" And he's like, "No." And do you know this guy? No. And I'm like, "I mean, you, I, I know you know this, but there's like little pods all over Michigan." So I'm I'm into. Oh yeah, it's totally like that. The same way in Grand Rapids, there's like a handful of guys in Grand Rapids. Yep. You know. Exactly. Handful of guys in Detroit, Ann Arbor area. Handful of guys. You know, oh, you know, Marquette's full of great skiers, and uh, you know, Copper Harbor. Uh, there's some really good backcountry skiers up there, and these guys are animals. And uh, you know, but it's just this big family of people, you know. And so it's just because you're from downstate, nobody disses you or calls you a wuss. You know, they come on, we're going to go tour off the 550 or something, you know, and you go out and you do a great tour and you share stories and break bread and everybody's got a couple of beers in their pack, you know, and it's just, that's all I want to do. I don't want to buy lift passes. I just want to backcountry ski with some mates and go to Telefest, you know, and uh, when that year, two years ago, the 30th, yep. uh, I was fortunate enough at the end of February to go up to Canada to the Snow Flea Festival that's celebrating 20 I think 23 years now. Oh yeah. A lot of, uh, a lot of people year. don't know about that one. That's a, that's, yeah, it's that's up one in, that's on it's, the radar. Yeah. That's uh they got some big mountains up there, man. You know, we skinned up this one overlook just to look over the Lake Superior and it was, you know, a 1200 foot vertical skin up and then it's just nothing but Aspen trees down for like a half a mile of knee deep to waist deep powder run after run after run. Yeah, and that's on and that's on the Canadian side on Superior. It's on Lake Superior, but on the Canada side, correct? Yeah. So you know, you got Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, which is where the St. Mary's River and the Sioux Locks come out of the Lake Superior that go down to Lake Huron, then Michigan, and then uh, you know all that for the big boats that come through, and the St. Lawrence Seaway comes through there as well uh, into you know Ontario, and then on the other side you got Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, and then north of that is uh the Goulet River Valley 
and that's where Searchmont Ski Area is, and that place is, I think it's like 650 vertical, but it is wickedly steep and fast, and that's was a training grounds for the Canadian national ski team a lot of times because huh. it's just so gnarly and uh, it's just great skiing up there and they've got a really cool cross country area that's a destination called uh oh Stokely and I think they've got like 225 kilometers of groomed skating lanes and diagonal stride but if you're a backcountry skier you are surrounded with two three fo- hundred foot hills that you can skin up and ski trees you know at the same place and so the back country up there is just incredible and uh my friends Ann and robin own this uh, bed and breakfast up there so they host this event every year and they lease 2500 acres from the canadian government and that gives them permission to go out there and clip saplings so every fall they have a, a four-day weekend in october called the loppet and you bring your shears and your chainsaw and your chaps and you go up there and you trim. Okay, we're going to do another lane on this one. You know, every day you got a new project with all these volunteers. Well, because of the COVID, they couldn't do it this year or the last year. So uh, looking forward to be being part of that this fall to go, you know, give my time back to make, you know, more runs that we can have fun on. So, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, go go lop it. You, you make sure to let me know when that's going on. That's uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll it's put usually the word out. like around the 15th of October, right around there, you know, because they can get snow then too. You know, it's far enough north, but it's it's really beautiful up there and uh, such great people and great music. You know, we always have local musicians come and uh, do a nice jam session a couple nights. You know, everybody's welcome to sit in, and then they got like a performance on the Saturday night. And it's just really good. And local ski shops, you know, provide just mountains of swag. And so everybody goes home with more stuff than they came with, you know. And uh, it's just a really cool thing. And Ann and Robin are very good hosts. They uh, do their own sugar shack. So, we, you know, every morning it's like pancakes and eggs and homemade syrup and, you know, I bring beer up as much as they'll let me cross the border with and, you know, uh, <laughs> You know, we're making pots of chili and spaghetti sauce. Everybody pitches it in the kitchen. And it's just a big family for, you know, there's men and women both and there's kids. And it's just fun to see little kids out there shredding powder, unafraid of anything, because that's how they've been brought up up there, you know. So that's so pretty cool. cool. And it's about eh, about 35 to 45 people, maybe, you know, on a, on the big day, which is Saturday. But, you know, we were out there a couple of days early. So we got uh, first cracks on everything on the fresh. And it was just amazing, you know, because after my issues, I was told I'd never do that again. So I was able to prove my doctors wrong. So that's good. Yeah. You, you are, you are the, the miracle man for sure, dude. (laughs) You pushed through some hard stuff. Yeah. It's been a bit of a rock and roll uh, rodeo the last couple of years, but I'm on the downhill and shady side of everything now. So that's good. I love that. Well, hopefully I can make it out, uh, out your way next winter and, uh, yeah, snowfully, maybe that's, maybe that's when I need to come out and do that with you. Maybe. Yeah. It's a, it's worth doing, man. It's a, you know, it's a little hinky going across the border, but you know, <laughs> we just, we don't lie. We tell them what we're doing. We're going to Telmark skiing at Bellevue Valley. Oh, okay. Yeah. You're one of those guys. eh? have fun. You know, you'll get pulled so, in it, for sure. If I go with you, you'll get pulled into secondary. Cause every time I go to Canada, I get pulled into secondary. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they're not They're One thing about Canada, they're more concerned with, you know, you trying to smuggle alcohol across totally. than anything else. So, you know, I mean, all in all, it's just, you know, anything you need, you can get across the board and they got great breweries up in Canada now. And they, they kind of lifted their, restrictions on the taxation of the beer so it's like england and scotland and ireland where you know the government taxes by the alcohol content and that's what they were doing in canada so pretty much six percent beer is about as big as you could find you know Uh, and now they've lifted that a little bit so the craft breweries are you know they're doing barrel aged stouts that are 13 percent and stuff but they've got some really good beers coming out up there and uh, really quirky names and, you know, packaging and stuff. It's a lot of fun. I just like it. You know, it's like taking a step back 10 years in our brewing industry in the States, you know. Uh, so they're a little bit behind 
maybe the curveball, but they're doing everything brilliantly, and I love it. And, uh, you know, nice people, too. It's just really a nice change of pace. And, you know, I'm 100% Swedish, so when I go to Minnesota, I come back with my Swedish accent again. <laughs> I go to the UP and visit my Finnish friends. And then I start talking like a Finlander. I go to Canada, and then every other word is A, you know? So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's a lot of fun. So yeah, hopefully, yeah, you can get back and, you know, so uh, anyways, yeah, the whole skiing thing, the Telefest, I'm just glad that that's still going on. You know, we hit a time when it got a little bit too corporate and everybody pulled out because it wasn't fun anymore. So, uh, you know, Keith uh, Opperman, who you've had on your podcast right after the Telefest a couple of years ago, you know, he has done a lot of work with some of his buds to resurrect this telefest now and you know i know he's been working with you uh with the demo fleet so i'm really excited to, for next year's you know telefest to go up and be able to demo some skis and just have it back to the roots thing that it should be you know yeah and uh he's put a lot family of work friendly in. yeah and it's so it's really awesome you know we've got the younger generation coming up and taking ownership of this because you know they can do it they got more energy and they've got ideas and you know not all are great, but you know, it's, a, it's an effort <laughs> to do the thing the right way, you know, and that's, what's cool. The beauty of youth, good ideas, but not well, all of them are good. <laughs> well, you know, we can all say that about us too, you know, yeah, no, so, uh, but, but it's like, we're, it's like we're saying there's, there's that <coughs> cycle of life, whether you're brewing beer or, or dropping knees, yep. it's like, you know, it, the fact that people are making an effort, I mean, they'll figure it out, you know, and you figure out the stuff that works and doesn't work and you just keep on going, you know, one foot yep. in front of the other. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Well, so yeah, it's going to be interesting to see the future of that in the next few years. Now that, you know, we've gotten through a crazy four years of politics and probably another crazy four years to come, but, uh, the pandemic and the vaccines are all, you know, uh, hopefully a thing of the past for a little while, you know, and we can get back to being humans and hugging our friends and be able to, you know, go places without a mask. And, you know, it just feels good to kind of get back to normal. So I'm really looking forward to 2022's Telefest because that's going to be a really blessed time. And yeah, hopefully we'll have a lot of folks come out and, you know, just take, you know, sucker from the fact that you know we're out skiing powder in the great part of the planet and everybody's friends and there's no hassles and no politics and no cell signal so that's a beautiful thing in my opinion so i love that well i think that's a good spot to end my brother I, is leave it on that beautiful note of telefest 2022 and uh you bet hopefully we'll see you up there and uh we'll uh we'll look for the uh sample beers that uh <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, Come yeah. From your can line. samples. Yeah, nothing's for sale. Don't worry, MLCC. I'm not <laughs> selling my beer. So <laughs> awesome, man. Thanks so much for coming on, man. It was so good talking to you. And, and oh, and Josh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be part of this. Uh, I told you this personally, and I'll tell everybody out there in uh, radio or computer land that you know, having the free hill life and the blogs and everything on during the pandemic was like my savior when I was stuck at home. You know, I couldn't wait to get a notification each week about another episode, you know, from the shop or Tosti's View or any of that stuff. And just a lot of the video that you guys have posted, too, of old ski movies and such. Just awesome to watch that stuff. We'd sit around there in our little pod of people with our masks and our rubber gloves, drinking a beer 10, 12 feet apart, going, oh, check that out. Oh, that's so cool. Remember when skis were like that? You know, <laughs> it was a hoot. And so thanks for doing all this. Always, man. And uh, it's so great. I'm, I love reminiscing about stuff because sometimes I forget how much time has gone by. And it's it's uh, it's like yesterday, isn't it? Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's just it's so awesome to think about just all the time that's gone by and sleeping in my van outside your brewery and <laughs> <laughs> all sort, all yep. sorts of random yep. stuff. So I just, I, yeah, I appreciate yeah. everything you've done for me over the years too. Oh, no problem. No problem. It's been extremely fun and, uh, there's more to come. So more, more to come. Oh, awesome, man. Well, enjoy the spring. Well, I guess summer now enjoy the summer and, uh, hopefully we'll, uh, connect in the winter time. Oh yeah. Well, you may see me this fall in Salt Lake city. So I'll let well, you know, please come out. All right, man. All right. Talk to you soon, man. See ya. All the best to you, Josh. Bye-bye.
Love walking down memory lane with those old friends that have uh, supported me through a lot of crazy times doing Telemark movies and events and articles and man, it's just so cool. And no joke, like uh, Bert's been there for me so many times on so many levels and I'm so glad we got connected through Telemark skiing like so many of my other friends over the years and uh, I'll always remember, you know, sleeping outside the uh the old livery there in benton harbor michigan i always used to and it's like yeah i think i mentioned that it's like i always used to tell people like oh i'm showing my telemark movie in benton harbor michigan they'd be like what <laughs> so but uh man we always had a great crowd and and uh it was fantastic and of course fantastic beer so it was great and uh Bert's a Bert's an awesome guy so so good to catch up with him, kind of get his unique story, and he's definitely one of those figures in the Midwest that has been part of the fabric of uh, building Telemark there, you know, in his local community and sharing his expertise with beer, obviously, at the festivals and all that good stuff. So that was a really fun, uh, just, yeah, a little, little bit of memory lane for me and then a little bit of just um, kind of digging into the history of Telemark skiing in the Midwest and one of those great people that's helped grow, grow it in that area. So, so thanks for listening. And, uh, as always, how you can support the podcast and everything else we're doing, you can shop for all your telemark goods at freeheallife.com. And we've got some great new lifestyle stuff coming in this summer and there's, uh, still some leftovers from the season, but we will, uh, yeah, we're just going to keep plugging away over the summer and always love to check back when, when we refresh stuff. Also, something to mention is if something is out of stock, we've added a new thing to the website where uh, you can actually, if it shows out of stock, you can actually click on a button and uh, put your email in and you'll get notified as soon as it's restocked. So especially for used parts you might be looking for or things like that, uh, that's always a good way to kind of make sure that you're first in line to get stuff again. And uh, we're always working on stuff during the summer to kind of better the experience. And, and that's one of those things we've done. Uh, if you want to read about articles, gear reviews, and more, you can become a subscriber of telemarkskier.com. We would love to have you over there. Uh, you can also be part of the forum uh, that is free. The forum is free. Feel free to do that. And there are some freebies on the site as well. But it is a site powered by you by the telemarkers by the protectors of the turn and the free heel lifers and not by advertising because that's how we make a long lasting product that works for you so we hope you'll become a part of that community and uh on top of uh shopping with us at free heel life and uh, you can always email your comments uh corrections all the good stuff to podcast at freeheallife.com and I will do my best to get back to you or make adjustments on the podcast moving along. So thanks for listening. I hope you have a fantastic week and I hope you're doing stuff to stay in shape so that that leg burn is a little less in the fall and the winter next year. And until next week, my friends, spread telemark always. <laughs>